for him. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to start talking about what I was saying at the end last time, um, which uh, um, is that liberalism, what Grant calls liberalism, which aims at um, emancipation of the passions and um, and uh, absolute freedom seems like it would lead to a society of maximum individuality, so to speak. I mean, in some sense of individuality, right? I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I mean, I guess either in the sense of autonomy, as Royce understands autonomy, right? Meaning that, like, no one else tells you what to do. Um, you do what you want. And, um, and also in the sense of uh, originality and uniqueness. Right, because everyone would be following their own individual passions and whatever, and so each would be uh, original and unique. But Grant says that the effect of this unrestrained individualism is actually the opposite. Um, at least as far as anything important, like anything that people actually care about, what this leads, the effect of this is to homogenize society, to make everyone the same. Um, I think that's what I was saying at the end last time. And now I'm going to continue on from there and say that, right, so liberalism, um, leads to homogeneity, and because it leads to um, homogeneity, it leads to universalism. Um, um, that is, uh, um, because everyone is the same everywhere, there's uh, no point to maintaining separate particular loyalties. So, um, so liberalism tends to make everyone the same and also tends to um, uh, erase any particular boundaries and make one universal society everywhere. Um, or as um, as uh, Grant puts it, he says liberalism and or technology, I mean, like I was worrying somewhat last time about which one of these is the cause and which one is the effect, but they definitely go together. And he says that it's a dissolvent. <laughs> I guess that's pronounced dissolvent. I mean, usually we just say solvent. Um, but anyway, it's a dissolvent of every loyalty that's particular, local, um, or Grant uses this term a lot, but I'm not sure exactly what he means by it. It seems to be synonymous with local and particular, indigenous. Um, of course, that's not how we use indigenous now. Um, Um, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what he, what precise meaning he's trying to get across by using that term. Um, but, um, but it's the kind of, uh, 
particular or local loyalty that um, liberalism or technology tends to dissolve. And therefore, um, the end results of um, liberalism and, and or technology is the universal and homogeneous state. Right, the world state that includes everyone and in which everyone is the same. There's no special privileges. Uh, everyone is equal. I, I mean, no special privileges. There aren't the kind of differences which might found special privileges. Everyone is the same kind of person. <laughs> Um, so, uh, um, so this is where we're heading. Uh, this is a Straussian theme. Um, uh, I guess, you know, uh, not all, uh, liberal, Theorists have been in favor of a universal homogeneous state, um, but uh, although some have, um, but uh, I guess uh, Grant following Strauss thinks this is the logic of the position and this is where it's um, definitely headed in the long run. So, um, Oh no, I have Sorry. I'm trying to switch to the top of the camera, yeah. Um so this is on page fifty-two. Um The universal and homogeneous state is the pinnacle of political striving. The masses and the philosophers have both agreed that this universal and egalitarian society is the goal of historical striving. So, right, I mean, that's not strictly speaking true of the philosophers, let alone of the masses, but they've all agreed that a universal and homogeneous state is the goal of all historical striving. But um, I think Grant both thinks that, uh, well, I guess he thinks that at least the majority um, are, because they're, they're committed to liberalism, are at least implicitly committed to this goal, the universal and homogeneous state. Um, it gives content to the rhetoric of both communists and capitalists. Um, I guess communists do, at least Marxists, do predict a universal and homogeneous something. Whether it's a state or not is a different question. So, um, and yeah, I mean, and that's like, it's a good question because um, we, you know, we have seen a push to univers universalization and homogenization in some of the authors we read. Uh, we saw it obviously in Edwards, um, in probably most explicitly in De Clare, right at the end of anarchism, she's, or no, at the end of anarchism in American tradition, she says, in that day, there shall be neither kings. So no kings means that's the, that's the homogeneous part, right? No one will be above anyone else. There will be neither kings nor Americans. That's the universal part. Um, only men, over the whole earth, men, right? So that was the Claire. Um, but um, although de Claire 
at least does believe um, that this and or pinnacle because of its homogeneity is in a certain sense universal she doesn't think it's a universal state <laughs> um and it's it's not clear exactly what grant and declare disagree about here um but probably something important um Declare thinks the outcome of liberalism is a universal non-state. Um, and that homogeneity is exactly what will ensure that it's not a state. Right? No one can rule over anyone else. Um, um, whereas Grant, I mean, like Dewey and Adams, uh, and plenty of other people thinks that, uh, um, of course, in our society, we need corporate action. So somehow these homogeneous individuals have to find a way to act together in the interests of the public good, um, uh, or at least in the interest of maintaining their freedom from each other or something like that. And so um, somehow, although it's not 100% clear how actually, um, they're, they're going to have a state. Um, um, say a little bit more about the comparison between declare and because I think you know other people we read declare is the one who gets again well no I think even more than Edwards declare is the one who gets closest to saying the goal of liberalism is universality and homogeneity um so um but so but nevertheless one thing is that she doesn't think that that result is a state and the other thing is that um, she, um, and by state here, right, I mean like political state, right? I, I mean, I take it that's what Grant means. Yeah, I think that's clear, right? I mean, because I guess by a universal and homogeneous state, you could mean like a state of existence that's universal or something like that. But here we mean, you know, what Hobbes calls a commonwealth. Right, a universal and homogeneous government of the earth. Um, so, um, so like, so that's obviously not part of Declare's uh, pinnacle or goal of striving. Uh, another thing that's different is, well, um, the connection between this and technological progress. Um, so, or I guess I could say that the connection between political progress and technological progress. So, I mean, Declare does think that at least up to some point, the history of the world is a kind of development or unfolding, right? I mean, that's what that's what development means, unfolding, <laughs> right? So, like that's what evolution also means, uh, even though Darwinian evolution is not really an unfolding. Right. So, but that's what the that's what the word means originally. So, like she does think that history is a kind of evolution or development, um, that, that it's a forward progress. Um, um, she also thinks technology develops, but it seems that at the very time when technology develops to industrial civilization. She thinks that uh, you know the new form of civilization that results is not progress over the previous one. But remember, she had that series of dominant ideas. The dominant idea of Egypt was the like, you know, that what we have must continue, it must be preserved, and the 
dominant idea of Bruce was something about change and, you know, whatever. And the dominant idea of the Middle Ages was placing God over man or, you know, and but then like the dominant idea of um, our society, she says, is making lots of things. <laughs> And as opposed to all these other ideas which have something good in them, and which I think she even thinks, maybe this isn't so clear. I think she feels they go, they get better. <laughs> but she certainly doesn't think that the dominant idea of our civilization is good or an improvement over those others. Um, So uh, if this universal and homogeneous um, society is the goal of political striving, she at least doesn't think that it's guaranteed by or even somehow correlated with technological progress. I mean, maybe she and Grant really don't disagree about that much here. Um, She sees that to have universality and homogeneity without a state, which would be a tyranny, um, you have to somehow uh, decouple it from technological progress, master technological progress, perhaps even send it backwards. Um, uh, and, you know, I guess Grant would say that's impossible, but she can't assure us that it's possible, <laughs> right? I mean, um, it's not easy to say, according to her, whether we'll be able to pull this off. Yeah. Um, uh, but we should we should all we should be trying. <laughs> um. So, uh, um, well, that's something I was going to say, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I want to say it. I mean, it's true, but I'm not sure if it really fits in here. I, I guess it does. So the thing is, like, so Declare and Grant both believe in a difference of what they call civilizations. Um, and I guess so does Dewey, right? He talks about our industrial civilization compared to older forms of civilization. Um, uh, Grant also apparently calls these same thing cultures. Um, but uh, but there's actually um, a big difference between the way Dewey and Declare think of difference of civilization and the way Grant thinks of it, which is that they think of it as a temporal sequence. Um, now that's like hard to justify when you think about it carefully, right? There hasn't been just one civilization at each time. Uh, I don't know how to count them, but there certainly seem to be more than one at various times, uh, including perhaps now, but certainly in the past. So, uh, but nevertheless, like when Declare lists the different type of civilizations, they come after each other, Egypt, Greece, the Middle Ages, <laughs> and now. <laughs> um, whereas Grant thinks of the difference of civilizations in fundamentally spatial terms. Right, different civilizations are local, they're in different places. That may be what he means by indigenous too. I mean, that they're like, they're in their, the place that they were formed in or something like that. Um, um, so, I mean, you know, it's for that reason, I guess, that they don't even face the question of, 
will this universality this you know cause us to will it be a dissolvent of all civilization um i mean from their point of view every civilization is a dissolvent of the one that came before it and this one is no different um and you know i mean that's the way Hegel thinks about this too. Uh, um, not the way all Western philosophers have thought about it, but um, but I guess you know, um, as I said, when you compare the two, it seems like Grant's way of thinking about it is is certainly better i think uh, um, to say otherwise you have to say that certain civilizations are special um that you know hegel does think that um but it's not very easy or good to maintain <laughs> right so anyway um um, I, but so one reason I mentioned that is that it seems like there's a third alternative in Du Bois. Um, so like there's three different ways of thinking about what the relationship of a universal civilization would be to particular civilizations. One is that the 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 one grant says, well, since it's universal, it would eliminate all the, the local civilizations, that is, the particular ones. Another one is what uh, Dewey and um, I guess Declare think, which is that uh, like all civilizations, it will, you know, there, there's one civilization that's world historical at any given time, and it's always, uh, it, it's always, Dissolve, it always dissolves the one that came before it. So that will cause some resistance, right? It will, that, will, that will be unpleasant to us in the transition, but, um, but there's no net loss here. We went from having one old civilization to one new one. Um, so, I mean, uh, I guess you can tell just from the title of that old, that early, uh, essay by Du Bois, The Conservation of Races, that he like he's he agrees with that there's no net loss, but he doesn't agree that at any given time there's only one. Ra or I mean he thinks that a universal civilization has to be composed out of the contributions of essentially different groups which he calls races, right? I mean, they don't, like the things he calls races in that essay don't correspond to what we usually think of as races these days. Some of them do, but some of them are like, you know, Northern European, you know, like Teutonic, British, Mediterranean, right? Those, you know, so, um, but there's these, you know, he thinks there's these groups that have different essences and their contribution is um, they have to remain separate groups in order to make the right contribution to the universal civilization. And at least in uh, um, Souls of Black Folk, he, he seems to consider, to continue to think just that. I'm not sure if he still thinks that when he writes Dark Water. Okay, so I mean, that's an alternative that Grant doesn't really discuss. Um, as for what Grant thinks about race or like what he doesn't say about race, I hope to get back to that later. Um, um, I guess another alternative is Edwards. I haven't talked about that yet. So like, does Edwards think that 
um, the goal is a universal and homogeneous state. Well, Edwards thinks there's already a universal and homogeneous state. Right? I mean, there's the kingdom of God, which we're all subjects of. And that's why we shouldn't be subjects of any more particular kingdom. Um, um, and I guess uh, Tolstoy, who declared counts as an anarchist, uh, and I mean, you might count Edwards as an anarchist for this reason, but like Tolstoy, uh, I guess, thinks the same thing, right? That uh, the reason we can't have particular states and particular loyalties is that uh, we already have loyalty to the existing universal state. Um, and Kant also sort of thinks that. Right, that there's a kingdom of ends that we're all subjects of, and that um, he thinks of it a little bit more complicated, right? Because he thinks that the structure of the kingdom of ends is that the legislative is all rational beings, but the executive is God. That's that's Kant's version of it, um, but it's still an existing universal state. Um, uh, What would Grant say about that? I'm not sure. Um, okay, but anyway, like I, mean, I don't know if that was helpful or not. It's certainly helpful for me to like the, the, to understand what Grant is saying, and then to go back through all the other people we've seen who talk about similar themes and see how well. The positions that Grant lays out match match them, and the answer is, I guess, not surprisingly, that it matches them somewhat, but not completely. <laughs> um, so, um, in any case, uh, um, the there's on, on the other hand, there's another difference between Grant and all these people, or well, there's another difference between. Grant and many of these people, but not Dewey. I think Dewey emphasizes the exact same thing, um, which is that um, this universality is not supposed to follow from a universal principle. Right? So, like, I mean, um, the way we saw universality threatening particularity and also, the United States threatening Canada, like early version of Canada, right? Um, in uh, in Bentham, like reacting to the Declaration of Independence, was that's fine. You set up these these principles, but look, the effect of adopting this universal principle is that you're going to um, uh, it's going to end up being coercive and bullying because uh, since you believe your principle is universal, you won't be able to tolerate those who have other particular loyalties. So like you're going to want to invade Canada and you're going to want to punish the loyalists who are living among you. So like the Canada they're invading is French Canada. And the loyalists there who are living among them are in large part the ancestors of English Canada. <laughs> right? That's that's how English Upper Canada at least got a big start was the loyalists leaving the United States after the revolution or during and after the revolution. So right, and so in Bentham, the 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 fear is that these universal Jeffersonian principles are like as principles going to be uh, coercive and bullying be because they're universal. But in this universal and homogeneous state that um, that liberalism is heading towards, according to Grant, um, there won't be a universal principle. And uh, remember, that was the same thing Dewey emphasized. Right, there isn't going to be a universal eternal standard of good that we apply to everyone. 
And that's where the universality and homogeneity comes from. I mean, like, of course, Dewey doesn't talk, doesn't talk about homogeneity, but um, as I discussed last time, I think Grant thinks that, that what Dewey imagines as a kind of like um, uniqueness and originality for each individual, from Grant's point of view, they're all the same in anything that's important, right? So, so this um, um, universality and homogeneity don't result from the application of a universal principle. Rather, it's like the, the absolute freedom from principles acts like the most universal principle of all, <laughs> right? The fact that there's nothing to do but respond to circumstances and solve problems as they come up and we can't appeal to universal principles because they would become out of date as technology progresses. Um, according to Grant, that acts like um, a universal, like that, that absence of universal principle acts like a universal principle, but worse. So why, why is that? Um, I think, it's roughly speaking because uh, when we attempt to free ourselves, so like if we had a universal principle that we were that we were basing our society on, something we considered un like universal and eternal, then that would provide us with goals or ends, and we would use technology to try to achieve those ends. And I guess, presumably, we would reject technology if it seemed to be uh, acting against those ends. But now we try to free ourselves from any kind of goal like that. I mean, we've tried to. So like, actually, I mean, that's, that's the way um, Grant portrays the situation, and it's like, I guess, at, at least one type of straightforward reading of Nietzsche, probably a straight, any straightforward reading of Nietzsche is probably wrong, but, <laughs> um, you know, we're trying to achieve absolute freedom, and that's why we're rejecting these, you know, Dewey, it's a little bit more, um, at, at least, in the Dewey we read, as opposed to the Dewey that Grant describes, um, it's not exactly that we're trying to free ourselves from these principles. It's just that they um, are not useful in our situation. They can't be applied. So we have no choice but to abandon them, basically. Um, so it's like, do, there's a little ambiguity in Dewey about whether really, I mean, I guess, you know, the question is, does he identify the necessary and the good the way Grant claims he will have to? I'm not sure he's completely explicit about that. But in any case, you know, Dewey agrees that this is the situation. We don't have these universal principles. So what happens um, with technology in that situation? And I think Grant thinks what that means is that Technology is no longer a means to something else. Technology itself is in control. So the advance of technology is like happens and we react to it. We don't get to decide what to use it for. Um, that part does sound a lot like Heidegger. Um, I, I wouldn't. I'm not sure Strauss doesn't say that, but it's more of a Heideggerian theme. Like just, again, especially later Heidegger, the concept of enframement, or, you know, the standing reserve, whatever, is about that, about technology um, ceasing to be a means to an end and um, just somehow like, um, itself producing this this universality and homogeneity because of its own uh like inexorable progress 
we all have to be the same because the technology demands this. Oh, I have the cat following me here. You can't see the room. Um, so, uh, um, and I think Grant's horror about the, our, our ability or supposed ability to manipulate human nature is because um, the application of technology to that, at least from his point of view, makes it especially clear that technology can no longer be a means to an end. So, um, I mean, just um, like to remind you or show you how deep his, his horror of that is, um, this is in chapter seven on page 92. It says, um, the possibility of nuclear destruction and mass starvation. I guess he means or mass starvation. I don't know, anyway. The possibility of nuclear destruction and mass starvation may be no more terrible than that of man tampering with the roots of his humanity. Or I guess I should have started here. Will it be good for men to control their genes? The possibility of nuclear destruction and mass starvation may be no more terrible than that of man tampering with the roots of his humanity. Like, what's so bad about that? Tampering with the roots of your humanity. Um, all right. <laughs> what's so bad about that? Um, is it just kind of like, ew, you know, I, I don't think so. I think Grant, there's, there's something particular that horrifies Grant about it. And I think I think he thinks that, and he supposes at least that he's following Plato and Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas when he says this, that we can, so to speak, read the doctrine of the eternal human good off eternal human nature, right? So when we're trying to determine what is this eternal good that is going to supply us with goals, um, and then once we have those goals, we could use technology as a means. Um, he, uh, um, the way we get it is by examining human nature and seeing what is the good for human beings. Um, so, uh, it's not the only possible reading of Plato and especially Plato, um, I, I think, you know, Kant certainly has a different understanding of Plato. Uh, but um, this is this is the way Grant understands, and I guess, the, well, the way Strauss at least talks about these people. So if that's the case, then um, as soon as you apply technology towards changing human nature itself, um, you're um, abandoning all thought of having the good as an end, right? Because again, the way you were supposed to get it was to examine human nature and see what's good for us. Um, so like what's um, uh, good for us, therefore in that sense, can't be changing human nature. So if now you're using technology to, humans, to change human nature, it's a sign that you've completely abandoned the attempt to, uh, to determine what the human good is. Um, and so it's like an extreme sign that technology is in control. So, um, Right, so all of that was a long explanation of what I wrote up here really quickly, right? That liberalism and or technology leads to homogeneity and universality. Um, it leads, leads to a universal homogeneous state. And therefore it's a dissolvent of all local or particular or indigenous loyalties. And, um, um, that's supposed to be true in general. Um, 
right? So this is back in chapter five on page 53. You know, maybe there's no point in reading this, but it's just, there's many places where he says something like this. Uh, modern civilization makes all local cultures anachronistic. Where modern science has achieved its mastery, there is no place for local cultures. Okay, so that's the conclusion. Question, is there something especially important about the case of Canada? Or is it just an example? So uh, it, at least in some place, seems like Grant's answer is no, there isn't anything especially important about the case of Canada. Um, this is near the end of chapter seven on page 94. Um, if the universal and homogeneous state would be a tyranny, um, by the way, Grant defines tyranny as a regime that would be destructive of human excellence, right? That is, he doesn't define it as um, a monarchy where the monarch is illegitimate, <laughs> which maybe is the most proper definition of it. Um, he doesn't define it as a uh, repressive regime or something like that. He defines it as a regime that's destructive of human excellence. So it could be like very um, liberal, <laughs> but still be a tyranny. All right, so anyway, if the universal and homogeneous state would be a tyranny, then the disappearance of even this indigenous culture, that is Canada, can be seen as the removal of a minor barrier on the road to that tyranny. Right, so that like a minor barrier is, you know, his way of saying, no, there isn't anything special about Canada. It's not like the most important indigenous culture uh, or that is local or particular culture. Um, uh, but, you know, um, it's just part of the bad thing that's gonna happen everywhere. Now, I mean, of course, it's consistent of Grant not to claim that there's anything special about this case, right? Because like the whole point is um, that what's under attack here and what he's trying to, well, not exactly defend, but lament, right? Um, is that, um, you know, one is loyal to the particular that is, one loves one own, one's own, as he sometimes puts it, um, because it's one's own, not because it happens to be the one particularity that's picked out by some universal principle, some universal considerations, let's say, right? So, like, because if it were, it wouldn't really count as as particular loyalty. Right? So, like, in other words, if if I'm like if I'm loyal to my nation because I think my nation is the world historical nation, um, uh, and therefore like universal considerations demand loyalty to this particularity, then I'm you know I I really don't have a particular loyalty. Um. Which I guess, at least in theory, is could be Grant's objection to Royce, right? Like according to Royce, um, there's this principle of loyalty to loyalty. Now, like in practice, it's so hard to 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 use that it doesn't result in everyone settling on the same cause. Um, everyone applies it in their own way, and therefore everyone becomes loyal to different causes. But like. In principle, you know, there's one cause that's best for loyalty, and you should all be loyal to that one. <laughs> um, so, um, and, you know, so like in practice, Royce thinks we can't take it that far, but we, we can take it to some extent, right? Like we can 
you know, if our particularity seems to be predatory, then we should abandon it, even though it's our own. Um, so again, like Grant's not wanting, like wouldn't want to give an argument necessarily of why Canada is a, an especially important case. However, <laughs> um, he does at least admit that Canada is a worse case in some sense, like more hopeless, or maybe it's just like the canary in the coal mine, right? Like it's just the like the least able to withstand this dissolvent, um, and it's. For, for two reasons. I think the first one, although I think Grant is more interested in this one, I find it somewhat less interesting. Um, why is that? I mean, I find it somewhat less interesting from the point of view of American philosophy. So I mean, let me say what it is anyway. I'll get some of this stuff. So, you know, there's, there's, there's two things about the case of Canada that are, um, um, that are especially bad from this point of view. So one is that the United States is the center of whatever, dynamic, dynamic culture. Um, right, the United States is as at least as Grant portrays it. And I mean, there's definitely something to this. Maybe especially California, as I suggested when we talked about Royce. Um, United States is a society with no deep roots. So um, there's nothing to conserve. There's only universal principles. Right, like it was founded in the age of liberalism. Um, um, and de Klerk claims there's certainly at least something to this, right? Like, I mean, Locke was involved in the colony of Carolina before basically anyone was even living there. <laughs> now, I mean, the constitution that Locke wrote for the colony of Carolina, first of all, was not a liberal constitution at all, but second of all, like never came into effect. But nevertheless, I mean, that goes to show that the influence of Locke was already on the scene, like in the colonial period. It's not just from you know the time the declaration is written. Right? And that was like the I think the same point that Declare was making when she talked about American traditions and how American traditions gave rise to the revolution, but then they immediately started to decay. <laughs> um so um, um so the so for that reason the United States is the is the center of this um, universalizing and homogenizing um, force. And of course, Canada is right next door, right? The only thing that divides it is this um, arbitrary border. I don't think, like, Grant doesn't mostly, I think he, he does at one point when he, he mentions the 49th parallel, um, you know, it's like, it's not a natural border, right? It's, it's, the natural border is actually, <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna draw this right, but like, here's, <laughs> I don't know, like here's the St. Lawrence Seaway and here's the Great Lakes here, right? So like, you know, most of the border between the U.S. and Canada, of course, it's just like an arbitrary straight line, right? They just, just you know, it's all on a line of um, latitude or longitude, longitude right? No, latitude, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's on a line of latitude. 
right? And then, you know, in the Great Great Lakes, there's like more like wiggles and, you know, whatever. But, um, um, but the point is that the actual natural barriers are inside Canada. Right, this is the thing I mentioned before about, you know, so there's like the Canadian Shield, which is like a region where the soil is very thin and there's rock right underneath it. Um, there's the Canadian Rockies. There's uh, like, um, I don't know exactly, there's, but um, I, I guess like the, the inland region of Atlantic Canada is not very habitable. Uh, right, like Labrador or whatever. So there's basically, you know, there's these separate regions like Atlantic Canada, the Great Lakes region, the prairies, British Columbia, and each one of them is like naturally closer to the corresponding area of the U.S. than it is to the other parts of Canada, right? Like to make this happen, they're had to be a political will and people had to do things that like from a strictly economic point of view didn't make sense like build the trans canada or the not the, the build the um um transcontinental build a transcontinental railway railway in canada <laughs> even though it would be easier to transport things by rail by going down and across um so, uh, right, so there's this kind of like arbitrary border here, and that's all that stands between Canadians and the great universalizing and homogenizing force. And um, therefore, uh, um, Canada, like, especially doesn't have any chance of standing up to this. Um, And then, as you recall, in Chapter 5, Grant uh, talks about two objections to the idea that the United States is the like spearhead of progress, um, right? He says, on the one hand, there's the Marxists who say that, um, no, the United States is a reactionary society because it's still, con it's still capitalist and that, you know, the true end of liberalism is socialism. I mean, you know, uh, um, Dewey perhaps agrees with that. Well, it's, it's complicated. Remember, he says the way the Soviets are, the Soviets are doing, are working towards the right goal, but the way they're doing it involves coercion and violence. And, you know, but are they closer to it? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, so, uh, but anyway, so that, you know, and you recall that Grant's answer to that is no, Marxism is actually, relatively speaking, a conservative ideology. Because again, it accepts that technology is, an, is only a means to a fixed end, which is set by human nature. Um, um, and then on the other hand, the, Grant says American conservatives will say, no, America isn't the spearhead of progress because we agree with you, Grant, Grant, like too much of this so-called progress is bad. And thankfully, you know, so it's confusing because they're they, he describes them as going from opposite points of view. And of course, they do have opposite points of view, but they say they end up saying the same thing about America, that it's actually conservative. Right, um, the conservatives say, no, America is like the guardian of traditional Western values against dangerous anarchists and communists from Europe, etc. Right, and uh, like Grant's uh, response to that is um, that uh, what those American conservatives think of as traditional values are really just the first stage of liberalism, right? They're like Lockean liberalism. Um, so there isn't any, any real tradition that can be conserved here. 
Um, and on the contrary, the um, um, logic of that supposed tradition is precisely to push us forward beyond it. And rem remember, as I discussed last time, he interprets the results of the election of 1964 um, as like a sign that he's right about that. These American conservatives are really just another kind of liberal. And the more liberal liberals are the ones who are going to win elections. Right. So um, Johnson wins and Goldwater is um, like soundly defeated. Um, And because the corporations take Johnson's side, Grant says, the corporations and their corporate media take Johnson's side. Right, so, so Grant, Grant is like contemporary conservatives in some ways. He thinks the li there's, liberal, there's liberal control of the media. <laughs> Although I guess you could say he's like current uh, radicals in the same way because he thinks that corporations control the media. <laughs> he just thinks liberals and corporations are the same thing. Right? So, um, you know, and he definitely wasn't right about that in the short term. In the long term, it's hard to say. I mean, look at what's going on in Florida with Disney versus DeSantis. I, I'm not sure. But in any case, so the, like that's his answer to those two objections. So, you know, so so like as I said, that's one reason why Canada is a particularly bad case because there's, you know, like it's right next to the center of the problem. And there's only this very flimsy border. Although as I said, he doesn't even mention that, but there's only this very flimsy arbitrary border in between. Um, so like there's no way that this could last very long. Um but the second reason, which I think is more interesting, um, which he doesn't emphasize as much, but he does say it, is that, how to put this? I guess I say, Canada is essentially conservative, or I mean, I say it in a stronger way. There's, there's, so to speak, is nothing to Canada but conservative. In, in what sense, you know? I mean, that may, I mean, so like, okay, first of all, like that may sound ridiculous until you remember what he means by conservatism, right? So he doesn't mean that Canada is essentially right wing or something. I mean, his conservatism has many features that we would consider left wing. And he always puts those things in quotes when he uses them. He does, you know, but, um, uh, right? So among other things, that Canada is essentially conservative is supposed to, to like explain the, um, um, the appeal of socialism traditionally in Canada. Okay, but um, but what does he mean? Why does he say, or I mean, he doesn't put it in these words, but why is it that there's, so to speak, nothing to Canada but conservatism? Well, what did the English and French founders of Canada have in common? So like, as I was saying before, the English were descendants of loyalists who fled the United States during the revolution. Like the, what gave rise to Upper Canada was the rejection of the revolution. At least that's the way Grant puts it. I don't know, I, 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 I assume historically speaking, that's an oversimplification, <laughs> um, but, uh, but probably only an oversimplification, right? Like that was, that was essential to the founding of English Canada. Um, and the French, of course, obviously, right? Like today, the motto of Quebec is Je me souviens, right? I, I remember. <laughs> That's the whole point of Quebec, Quebec, <laughs> depending on which language you say it in. Right? So, and Grant says, 
Um, so like Grant points this out about English and French Canada. And then he says, this is in chapter six on page 67. Um, If their different conservatisms could have become a conscious bond, this nation might have preserved itself. An indigenous society might have continued to exist on the northern half of this continent. Right? So, like, um, what, um, what the bond would have been that held this, what the bond was that actually held the society together, and what the bond would have been that, um, Held it that um, such as the consciousness of that bond would have been necessary to try to preserve Canada. That bond was just this shared conservatism, two different conservatisms. What they had in common was conservatism. What they had in common was that that the. Um, point of their existence as a nation was, or a culture or a civilization was conservatism, was conserving, right? Like not letting the old ties be dissolved. Um, so as I said, I feel like this one is more interesting, right? So, 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 right, so that also shows why Canada in particular doesn't have a chance because like, it's directly hitched onto the thing that, mm -hmm. like in the abstract, that uh, technological civilization uh, um, makes look like nonsense. So, um, um, So, like, the reason I think this is more interesting is, although I think Grant doesn't want to follow it in this direction, but it can be followed in this direction, that... Hudson Bay, Great Lakes. All right, so anyway, <laughs> um, uh, so, like, what is this border a border between? Um, this fact about Canada suggests that it's not exactly a border between the universalizing state, right? Like we're viewing the United States as kind of like the universal and homogeneous state in embryo. This is the heart of it and it's growing out from there. Um, so, so like another word for this universalization is Americanization. Um, but says Grant, it's wrong to think that as the, as the spread of a particular culture, American culture, it's the spread of the negation of particular cultures, right? So, but so like this fact about Canada, if it is a fact, suggests that this border isn't um, exactly a border between the universalizing state and a particular loyalty. Rather, it's like, because for one thing, it's admitted that there isn't one culture or civilization um, on this, on the can Canadian side of the border. There's two at least. And what they have in common is just their explicit attachments to conservation of particularity, locality. So it suggests that you could think of this border as like a border between the universal state or universalizing state and the particular as such. <laughs> right, that like Canada is, is so 
I mean, so so this would make Canada into a special case, right? It would say that, you know, if you compare it to the Mexican border, let's say, you might say that, I'm not trying this right, leaving out Texas, whatever. Anyway, the Mexican border is down here somewhere. So, you know, you could say, well, like on the other side of this is Mexican culture. I mean, that also would be complicated, right? Because the Mexican culture also, as I think Grant even mentions at some point, has, you know, like this duality of Spanish versus um, um, indigenous culture in, in our sense of indigenous. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, you could say, yeah, this border is the border between the universal state and Mexican culture. And Mexican culture is something Mexicans want to conserve because it's Mexican, you know. It has particular Mexican features, whatever, and that's what they're trying to conserve. Um, so this would be a border between, I mean, I, like, I don't doubt that if we thought about Mexico long enough, we could make out that this is a really special case too. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to try to do that in this course anyway. So... Um, so you could say this is a border between the universalizing state and a particular nation, but you could say this is the border between the universalizing state and the very idea of something outside its border. Um, um, there's a book that, I have it right back here. There's a book that we possibly could have read, read for this course, but it would have been too hard and too long and it wouldn't have fit in. Called, uh, called A Border Within. I don't know if you could just, oh wait, I'm not showing it to you. There it is. Border Within, sort of a moose on it, by Ian Angus. Um, uh, a contemporary writer who in some ways is a follower of Grant, only partly, I guess I would say. And I think if I understand Angus correctly, that he he, he is saying something like that. Um, but in any case, um, you know, uh, Grant doesn't want to think of it that way. He just, he wants to think that there are two, yes, there's one border, but there's two civilizations here and they're both going to be dissolved. And in that way, they're not different from any other local culture or civilization anywhere. Um, So, you know, and take each one of those by themselves, and they do have their particular characteristics, right? There's more to them than just conservatism, um, right? So, like, for example, what he says about English Canada, um, this is in chapter six on page 69. says um, um, English-speaking Canadians have been called a dull, stodgy, and indeed costive lot. Costive is not is an unusual word which she likes to use. Um, as far as I know it literally means complicated, but I don't think he's using it in the literal sense here, but I'm not. Anyway, English-speaking Canadians have been called a dull, stodgy, and indeed costive lot. In these dynamic days, such qualities are particularly unattractive to the sheep. So, like, so far we're just talking about conservatism, I think. But then he says, yet our stodginess has made us a society of greater simplicity, formality, and perhaps even innocence than the people to the South. So now he's talking, I think, about what he takes to be particular cultural characteristics of English Canada. 
simplicity, formality, and perhaps even innocence. So simplicity and innocence are among Thoreau's watchwords, you may remember. Formality, not so much. Although one thing I didn't discuss about Thoreau's writing style is it's formality, maybe not. It's archaic, right? Like he likes to say things like low. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, but in any case, simplicity and innocence um, are among Thoreau's watchwords suggesting that Thoreau thinks that they're characteristic of the only true America, which would make sense because he noted that he kind of, at some point implied that the true America might be on the other side of the border. <laughs> um, but um, it's also interesting that, it, that, that this is, sounds similar, although again, I don't think you would include formality. Maybe in some way you could even. But it sounds similar to what Du Bois sometimes says about Blacks in America. Right? So this, I don't have the book here to, to show you that, but I'll just read it. We Black men seem the sole oasis of simple faith and reverence. I guess I just say, we Black men, we might have something men. We Black men seem the sole oasis of simple faith and reverence in a dusty desert of dollars and smartness. Right, simplicity, simple faith and reverence, that, that's close to simplicity, formality, and perhaps even innocence. Um, however, uh, Du Bois doesn't say anything about Canada that I can recall. Anyway, so, and as for the French, of course, it's easier there. Uh, and, you know, he talks about Catholicism, especially um being like a particular element of French Canadian culture. It's even I think like as against France. Right? Because it like French Canada is conservative compared to French France. French like France had a revolution. <laughs> Um, an anti-clerical revolution, which either never happened in Quebec or only happened in around 1960, <laughs> depending on how you look at it, right? So, um, so uh, there again, there's something in particular they're trying to conserve. Um, however, like I said, you know, like especially I think from the point of view of American philosophy, it's more interesting to think about it the way I was, right? Like, um, because um, because it introduces another kind of potential alternative to America. And I guess, um, yeah, I'm hoping to get back to say more about that in a moment when I compare Grant and Thoreau more at length. I think I'm still going to get to that. I have 20 minutes left. All right. So, um, but uh, this order is maybe not the best. Could be better organized. But, um, but before I talk about Thoreau again, I wanted to stop. I mean, well, yeah, this will basically lead straight into it. So it's 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 okay. This is this maybe this is the right order. So like what I wanted to stop and ask is what exactly does Grant count as a culture or civilization or apparently the same thing, a nation, right? So like all these um All these things he seems to use interchangeably. 
which first of all is important to notice because they're not evidently interchangeable, right? So you could be confused by not noticing that he seems to use them interchangeably. Um, um, I mean, at least, I guess I should say, assuming we're talking about a particular culture or civilization, that will be a nation. The universalizing civilization is like the dissolvent of nations, right? But um, so um, apparently these are three names for the same thing. So therefore, like a so-called culture that it's not a nation doesn't count. And I mean, this is what's going on, I think, in chapter five, when um, Grant discusses Diefenbaker's, according to him, according to Grant, Diefenbaker's failure to understand the importance of French Canada. Um, this is on page, in chapter five on page 22. He says, um, Ethan Baker's prairie experience had taught him to understand the rights of ethnic and religious communities, such as the Ukrainians and the Jews. Um, this is, uh, I guess, a famous quote by Ethan Baker, uh, at least it's in the Wikipedia <laughs> page, so it must be famous, where he actually, you know, where Ethan Baker said just this about his experience, right? That, you know, as I was growing up in Saskatchewan, I noticed that there were all these different groups and that but that the English speakers dominated over them. And I don't think that's fair. And we have to, you know, whatever. So we understood that. Um but skipping what's in the in the middle here, you know, uh Grant says but in what way was this different from the United States where Polish and Greek Americans keep their remembrances while accepting the general ends of the Republic, right? So in other words, Grant is saying, you can defend the rights of Jews and Ukrainians in Saskatchewan um, without thinking that they um, have to somehow form a nation. And therefore, you're not really treating them as culture, as a culture or civilization. Um, because look, look at what Polish and Greek Americans do. They managed to, you know, in some sense remain the, you know, Greeks and Polish, and but uh, not in a way that's inconsistent with being full members of American culture or civilization, right? And then he goes on, the French Canadian nation with its unique homeland and civilization is quite a different case, right? So that's what um, Ethan Baker didn't understand that French Canada is a nation that is a civilization or has a civilization that is, is a culture in the, in, the, in the strong sense, in the strict sense, the proper sense, right? As opposed to a kind of tourist attraction <laughs> culture. Now, um, it's a little bit odd. 1965, um, not to notice that the Jews might also be a special case. <laughs> um, like, are they a nation? Do they have a unique homeland? Um, uh, Um, but anyway, he's not interested in that. Maybe it's just not relevant to his purposes here. Um, but I think what's more interesting is uh, another example he mentions of an indigenous culture. Um, and that is supposedly the American South. So this is, um, wait, was that quote from page 22 really in chapter five? Is chapter five that long? No, that was in chapter two, I'm sorry. I said it was chapter five, but it's chapter two, page 22, but I was just reading. Now I'm gonna read from chapter 
five, page 65. So he says, um, Four of Goldwater's five states were from the South, right? So he's, um, you know, this is part of his argument that Goldwater didn't represent any like real possibility of conservatism. Four of Goldwater's five states were from the South. This was the last, last ditch stand of a local culture, but it is doomed to disappear as much as an indigenous French Canada. Right, so the American, so the idea here is that the American South supported Goldwater because the American South that is, is a nation, civilization, culture, or at least was, although it's doomed to disappear. Um, and, um, um, and uh, therefore, they didn't support Johnson, who was the you know who was the clear exponent of liberalism, which would be dissolvent to their civilization. Um, he also mentions on the same page, just a little bit farther up, and this is just like, by the way, right? He doesn't make a connection here. Johnson was supported not only by such obvious groups as Negroes and labor, but also by the new managerial blah, blah, blah. Why is it obvious that the Negroes would support Johnson? Um, it might have something to do with the nature of the indigenous culture of the American South. <laughs> um, in other words, these these facts that he like lists here might not be disconnected from each other. The indigenous culture, one of the features of the indigenous culture of the American South is black slavery. <laughs> um, now, I mean, um, that's not the only feature or at least you might think it's not the only feature. Um, and, you know, recall that Du Bois actually, um, at least early Du Bois, and I think he's sincere about this, he kind of warns the passing of the old Southern culture and the quote unquote Southern gentleman, right? Even though, as he says, the Southern gentleman is, is the same person who, you know, owned slaves, <laughs> right? They had Southern gentleman was living on a plantation, but nevertheless, like uh, Du Bois has apparently has some like apparently sincere feeling that there was something good about the Southern gentleman that we should be sad is gone. I don't know if later on the kind of respect that he felt left that way or not that way at all. Um, it also, it's possible to argue that he's just, I don't believe it's about him though, but it would be possible to think he's saying that for the benefit of his white audience to make what he's saying more palatable. Um, but in any case, so, you know, it's not the only thing, but it's kind of a striking thing if you ask what it is that those uh, uh, four states in the South were trying to defend against the dissolvent of liberalism. That they were what they're trying to defend is um, um, well, not of course still slavery, but you know whatever they've managed to hold on to of slavery um, against Johnson, who as a liberal is correctly seen as someone who's going to push civil rights, black civil rights. So, I mean, it looks like Grant is missing something there. Um, and it seems to like what he's missing is kind of similar to what Royce is missing when he talks about General Lee and his like, like the 
his conflict of loyalties. It doesn't even mention that one of these loyalties is loyalty to defending slavery. <laughs> um, like, I don't think it's because either Royce or Grant thinks there's, you know, something good about slavery. Um, but it shows that it's just not on their radar, right? They're just not like thinking about that. Um, so, um, and unlike Thoreau, Right? So unlike Thoreau, Grant never mentions that Canada was the terminus of the Underground Railroad. As far as I can tell, he never talks about that. You might think that was an important distinction between Canada and America. But that's where the, right, when, when uh, Thoreau says that amongst all the others, one real runaway slave visited him at his house and he helped, he forwarded him towards his North Star, he means He's sending him to Canada. <laughs> so uh, um, that is, Grant never thinks about the possibility of Canada as standing for freedom, um, right? Because it's liberalism that pushes freedom as the human essence. Um, and in fact, on the contrary, but this is, though I hope this will sound really weird to you. I mean, maybe it sounded weird to you if and when you read it before, but I hope it will really sound weird to you now after everything I just said. What Grant, Grant says, this is in chapter seven on page 88. In the 19th century, the United States appeared to be the haven of opportunity for those who had found no proper place in the older societies. Men could throw off the shackles of inequality. The shackles, right? These, these are metaphorical shackles, but he's forgetting about the literal shackles. <laughs> men, men could throw off the shackles of inequality and poverty in the new land of opportunity. To many Canadians, the Republic seemed a freer and more open world than the cost of this word again, colonial society with its restraints of tradition and privilege. Right? I mean, this is similar to the Claire saying, like, we've never had to fight against a privileged class. Oh, except for the that issue about Negro slavery. <laughs> um, but Grant doesn't even say, oh, except for that, right? Like he forgets about that. Um, um and then uh, on the next page, page 89, to the continentalists, both the French and British traditions in Canada were less democratic than the social assumptions of the United States. In such arguments, democracy has not been interpreted solely in a political sense. And we've, we've seen that among American writers, right? Like Adams or whatever. Democracy has not been interpreted solely in a political sense, but has been identified with social equality, contractual human relations, and the society open to all men, regardless of race or creed or class. American society is seen to be the development of the first mass, mass democracy on earth. Right? So again, in the 19th century, America's is the society that's democratic in the sense that it's open to everyone, regardless of race, breed, or class. Um, so, like, of course, like, it's different for a Canadian to make this mistake versus for an American to make this mistake, right? Like, for an American to make this mistake is, I think, uh, um, a sign of repression, of uncomfortable truths, um, perhaps could be a sign of moral corruption, um, um, a sign of racism for sure, right? For a Canadian to forget it, well, you know, I mean, um, um, 
it's not his business to remember everything about America. But nevertheless, you know, so that I'm not sure that I would say that this reflects poorly on Grant somehow, but in a like in a moral sense, but it does mean that he forgot something important about the significance of that border. And I think um, if you put these those two things together, and by those two things, I mean, number one, I, what I was saying about the possibility of viewing that border as just like the border of the universal, where the universal ends, <laughs> not as a border around something particular. <laughs> um, that's number one. And number two, remembering that what that border around the universal meant was actually was freedom. Um, then I think you can see, like, you can put them, these together into a kind of distinction between Thoreau and Grant on Canada, um, um, and how they see the significance of the border. This is a weird thing to discuss for various reasons. I mean, for one thing, you know, I'm basing a lot on these scattered things Thoreau says about Canada and Walden not even using what the explicit things he says about Canada in his book about his trip to Canada. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, and it's also weird because it's a different Canada, you know, like it's basically French Canada still in Thoreau's time. English Canada is just starting to take off maybe. Um, but nevertheless, like, I don't know. Anyway, this is what I'm going to say about it, right? So for Grant, but um, that border must be a border around something. Something positive has to be inside it. Like on the other side, outside it, there can be the mere idea, the mere universal. Um, but on the inside, there has to be something particular, local, indigenous. So that border is going to be the border between Republicans and loyalists or something like that. But for Thoreau, it's, I think it stands somehow, and this is, I tried to say this when I talked about Thoreau to begin with, and now it's bringing it back to contrast it to Grant, that the border is a border between the idea and what's free of the idea. It's to the border between the universal and something that's outside the universal. Um, um, so like it's agreeing with Grant that the universal, if it's allowed to become truly universal, will be um, tyrannical, is already tyrannical, according to Thoreau, both in the sense that it destroys human excellence and in the sense, in the sense that it enslaves Blacks and, and attacks Mexican, right? Um, so, uh, I mean, Thoreau isn't unaware of the conservative nature of Canada. I think he alludes to that in some other places. Since I'm almost out of time, I won't read them though. But he, I don't think he puts much stock in it. Where he talks about a Canadian he knows who like takes a French newspaper to keep up his French. And he says, that's pretty much what English speaking people do take an English newspaper for, <laughs> meaning that they're not actually using their reading for anything serious. They're just using it to keep up their language. I mean, he's more interested in that side of it, but what he's saying about the French guy, I think, is like the conservatism is not interesting to him. Um, um, so, or in other words, whereas for Grant, the connection between universality and tyranny is like a difficult philosophical connection to make. And he even says he can't, he's not sure about it. Right? So at the end of the book, he says, I can't be sure that this is a bad thing, but I'm going to lament anyway, because my lament is based on tradition, not on philosophy. But for Thoreau, it seems like the connection is simpler. Um, the universality is the tyranny. Um, 
And moreover, I think Thoreau perhaps could claim to have learned that from Plato. Um, but I obviously won't. I wasn't even planning to try to explain how. I'll just, but I'll just leave you with that thought. Okay, I will see you at the regular time on. Okay. Bye. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks.